Happy Sabbath. Jesus said that an hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall we worship. So I know that we're in a hotel right now, but I know that I can bless the Lord at all times. I can bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify. That psalm is great. We always get hype off of that. But when you continue to read in Psalms 34, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. I am honored to be here, humbled to be here with you. I just want to quickly thank... um, Mr. Edward Woods and Pastor Stephen Brooks and the Paul directors for inviting me uh, to speak this evening. I really do not want to belabor my gratitude as I do have a divine burden. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles, swipe with me in your Bibles, whatever you have brought with you. We're going to Judges chapter 19 this evening. Judges chapter 19. Yeah, this might not be your short word, so go ahead and put your seatbelts on. I'd like to invite you to stand if you don't mind. We've been doing a lot of sitting, and one of my favorite uh, pastors, Pastor Marquise Johns, he says that we stand uh, to reverence the written word, to prepare for the preached word that will, by God's grace, honor and exalt the living word. So I will begin in, here, in your hearing, reading from the Christian Standard Bible, from Judges chapter 19. And the Bible says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. A Levite staying in a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim acquired a woman from Bethlehem in Judah as his concubine. Stay with me. We're going to read a lot of scripture tonight, but we don't read this scripture a lot, so I really want you to read it. But she was unfaithful to him in verse 2 and left him for her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. She was there for four months. Then her husband got up and followed her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had his servant with him and a pair of donkeys. So she brought him to her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, detained him and, and he stayed with him for three days. They ate, drank, and spent the nights there. Jump down with me to verse verse 10. Unwilling to spend another night there, he got up, departed, and arrived opposite Jabus, that is Jerusalem. The man had his two saddled donkeys and his concubine with him. When they were near Jabus and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, please, why not let us stop at this Jebusite city and spend the night there? But his master replied to him, well, we will not stay in a foreign city where there are no Israelites. So let's go to Gibeah. Okay, now jump down to verse 16. The Bible says, in the evening, an old man came in from his work in the field. He was from the hill country of Ephraim, but he was residing in Gibeah where the people were Benjamites. Verse 20. The old man took them in saying, welcome, I'll take care of everything you need, only don't spend the night in the square. So he brought him to his house and fed the donkeys. Then they washed their feet and ate and drank. While they were enjoying themselves, all of a sudden, wicked men of the city surrounded the house and beat on the door. They said to the old man who was the owner of the house, bring out the men who came to your house so we can have sex with him. 
The owner of the house went out and said to them, please, please don't, don't do this evil, my brothers. After all, this man has come into my house. Don't commit this horrible outrage. Here, let me bring out my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Abuse them and do whatever you want to them. But don't commit this outrageous thing against this man. But the men would not listen to him. So the man, the Levite, the man of God, he seized his concubine and took her outside to them. They raped her and abused her all night until morning. At daybreak, they let her go. Early that morning, the woman made her way back, and as it was getting light, she collapsed at the doorway of the man's house where her master was. When her master got up in the morning, opened the doors of the house, and went out to leave on his journey, there was the woman, his concubine, collapsed near the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he told her. Let's go. But there was no response. So the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he entered his house, he picked up a knife, took hold of his concubine, cut her into 12 pieces, limb by limb and then sent her throughout the territory of Israel. Everyone who saw it said nothing like this has ever happened or has been seen since the day the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt until now. The Bible says, think it over, discuss it, and speak up. This evening's message is entitled Eloquent Rage. Let's pray. Your words are on my tongue. Spirit of the living God, speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. This evening, I come to you with a burden for my people. This evening, my soul is crushed under the weight of the pain and plight of the black woman. For centuries, black women have been the backbone, the hands, the feet, the, uh, even the brains behind our social justice movements. Yet we have always been forbidden from being the face. There is no emancipation without Harriet Tubman, yet we celebrate Abraham Lincoln. There's no civil rights without Rosa Parks, yet we memorialize Martin Luther King. There's no Black Lives Matter without Patrice Culler, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi, yet we've legitimized D. Ray McKesson and Sean King. Why is it okay for our mothers to feed the leaders and yet go unacknowledged for sustaining them? Why is it okay for our grandmothers to bail the leaders out of jail and yet go unacknowledged for liberating them? Why is it okay for our aunts to sing for the leaders and yet go unacknowledged for inspiring them? Why is it okay for our sisters to compose strategy for the leaders and yet go unacknowledged for equipping them? Why is it okay for our wives to march in the street for the leaders and yet go unacknowledged for mobilizing them? Why is it okay for black women to labor for justice while our contributions go unchronicled, our sacrifices go unacknowledged, and our strategic ability goes unappreciated? Why? Does the church continue to see activism, continue to see the work of social justice as a prophetic anointing reserved exclusively for those anatomically classified as male? <laughs> Marilyn French in her foundational text, The War Against Women, states, quote, Wherever and however men subjugated women, they justified it by declaring God or nature made 
women subordinate to men by endowing men, but not women, with certain traits like reason and logic and intellect and God gave them souls, things that women don't possess. And women have these things, but men don't have these traits like chaotic emotionality and unbridled sexuality. Women are subversive, subversive of good and proper order, end quote. It is this kind of patriarchal poison that infiltrates our theology and our practice so that we privilege the potency and possibility of the black man to the neglect and denigration of the black woman. Not realizing that the neglect and persecution of black women is the neglect and persecution of the human race. This patriarchal poison has also caused us to so elevate the black man's plight and pain that not only does the black church disregard the work of black women, but it also disregards the oppression of black women. The black church has elevated the criminalization of black men, forgetting that black girls are the fastest growing group in the juvenile justice system. Monique Morris, in her book, Push Out, the Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools, documents that, quote, black girls are 16% of girls in schools, but are 42% of the girls receiving corporal punishment. 42% of the girls expelled with or without educational services. 45% of girls with at least one out of school suspension. 31% of girls referred to law enforcement and 34% of girls arrested on campus. How is it that time and time again we gather and meet to discuss the importance of the church getting involved in social justice and yet the needs of women and girls, particularly black women and girls, is never mentioned. My Lord. My Lord. Why is it okay to expect black women to fight for black men but never expect, expect black men to fight for black women? One of the reasons why I believe the church has circumvented its moral responsibility to women of color is because we very tactfully circumvent the Bible's record of injustice against women. This evening, our scripture reading from the book of Judges is the only text in all of scripture that concludes with the explicit command, think it over, discuss it, and speak up. This explicit command to do justice is not attached to the enslavement of a man. It is not attached to the criminalization of a man. It is attached, rather, to the rape, beating, and dismemberment of a woman. And thousands of years later, history consistently repeats itself as women are constantly being physically, sexually, and intellectually raped beaten and dismembered by men in the church. Men on the front lines of social justice. In our avoidance of injustice against women, in our disobedience to the command to think this story over, to discuss this story and to speak up about this story, the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse of women is being perpetuated. Narratives of injustice against our bodies and our minds are being repeated and reenacted over and over again. But see, I believe that God teaches through repetition. My high school English teacher drilled this into our heads. Repetition is the key to learning. And oftentimes when I read scripture, I hear God saying the same thing. I hear God declare the correlation between learning and repetition when I'm confronted with the Gospels. Four books dedicated to telling one single story. I hear God passionately teaching the importance of repetition in the sentence structure of the Pentateuch when he declares that I am the Lord your God who has brought you up out of the hand of bondage, out of the house of bondage. 
I hear the sincerity of God when Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And by the time I get to Revelation, I understand the indescribable, uncontainable power of God when John declares him holy, 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 holy. It's clear throughout all of scripture that the Bible, that God believes that repetition is the key to learning. Most recently, I hear this claim in the heavy halls of the book of Judges. Following the plot of this narrative, my mind could not help but ask, are we in Gibeah or Gomorrah? Oh. I'm sure you remember the story. The story of a wicked city named Sodom and Gomorrah. A city known for its disregard for God and its affinity for immorality. A city known for its idolatry and its affinity for perversion. A city known for its homosexuality and drunkenness. We all know about Sodom and Gomorrah. We all remember the night God sent angels as messengers to search out the land to assess its depravity to determine the necessity of its destruction. We all remember how Abraham's nephew Lot housed the angels in his home and how the men of the city surrounded the house yelling, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us so that we can have sex with them. We know about the evil of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know about how these men demanded to exploit and abuse angels who they thought were men and how Lot offered his two virgin daughters in their stead. We know about how they denied the girls and went to break down the door because they wanted the men so badly. We know about how the angels struck the men with blindness so they were unable to find the entrance. We know that this was the concluding catalyst to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning sulfur from heaven. We remember Sodom and Gomorrah. But what's fascinating, saints of God, is we seem to have forgotten about Gibeah. We seem to have forgotten about that time when the house of God reached detestable levels of wickedness. We seem to have forgotten about that time when the men of the tribe of Benjamin began to disregard God. When the men of the tribe of Benjamin sought to exploit and abuse a man. When the men of the tribe of Benjamin sought only to indulge their flesh. When the men of the tribe of Benjamin sought to exploit and abuse a foreigner. When the men of the tribe of Benjamin attacked a home. When the men of the tribe of Benjamin raped a woman over and over and over again, beating her within an inch of her life. And when they had released all their aggression, when they had released all their arousal, when they had released all their anxiety, they left her for dead. We remember Gomorrah, but we easily forget about Gibeah. I believe one of the reasons we intentionally avoid this story in scripture is because in this story, God does not intervene. In Genesis 19, Lot's daughters are offered, but they are not abused. They are recommended, but they're rescued. In Judges 19, this concubine, this unnamed, unfaithful, unprotected woman from Bethlehem is thrown out into the hands of an angry and aroused mob. God, In Judges 19, the concubine is not rescued. The concubine is killed. Why is it that God intervenes and protects Lot's daughters from evil men in the world, but he doesn't intervene to protect this concubine from evil men in the church? I believe the first reason why God does not intervene to protect this concubine from these evil men of the household of faith 
is to show us that mayhem manifests when men have no king. Abuse of power is inevitable when men are left to govern themselves. Violence is unavoidable when men do not hold themselves accountable to God. Mayhem manifests when men have no king. The book of Judges is a very significant moment in Israel's history because scholars suggest that we are reading about a nation of people who have no leader. We're reading about the nation of Israel after Joshua's death. And by the time we get to chapter 19, not only is Joshua dead, but the nations of Israel have no judges either. So that Israel has absolutely no leadership. So that the book of Judges can literally be summed up by its concluding sentence. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. This is how the book of Judges ends, but it is also how our story in Judges 19 begins. The Bible says in those days when there was no king in Israel, a Levite staying in a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim acquired a woman from Bethlehem as his concubine. Now already we can see the effects a lack of leadership is having on this Levite. Rather than looking for a man of God, this man of the priesthood, this worship leader goes and acquires a concubine. Why? Because when God ceases to be king, a man sees a woman as something to possess rather than someone to partner with. The Levite was not looking for someone comparable, compatible, or complementary. He was looking for a concubine. Now, Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology defines a concubine as, quote, a female slave who functioned as a secondary wife and surrogate mother. The practice of taking concubines was perpetuated to meet the sexual desires of the males and or to cement political alliances between nations, end quote. In other words, this woman was acquired to be either the Levite's sex slave or to bear him children because his first wife was barren. Because this Levite lacked a king, someone to hold himself physically and spiritually and emotionally accountable to, this man possessed this woman. He acquired her like an item and restricted her to an object of sexual pleasure or reproduction. And so because she was acquired like a possession, she was treated like an object. I surmise she was treated like an object because verse two declares, she ran away from the Levite and stayed with her father for four months. Now the text identifies her as unfaithful and as an adulteress. And while some preachers and scholars tend to focus on the woman's crime of unfaithfulness to justify her demise, some translations of this Hebrew narrative suggest that she did not actually commit adultery with another man. Instead, she became angry with the Levite and was unfaithful because she left him and returned to her father, something she did not have the right to do. As the property of the Levite, this woman did not have the right to her own body. She could not determine what to and what not to do with her body. Those rights were reserved for the Levite. It's, it's very similar to the property relationship between African American slaves and white plantation owners. Our ancestors knew all too well what it meant to be property to be owned, to have no authority or control over your own body, to not be able to go and come as you please, to not be able to marry who you choose, to not be able to determine who you bore children with. Similar to this woman from Bethlehem, the fugitive slave laws of 19th century America prohibited anyone from helping a slave to freedom. It was even frowned on for slaves to run away of their own volition because they were subsequently viewed as thieves stealing property that did not belong to them. Let that sink in. You running away from your master 
was considered theft. A crime punishable by death. I can't help but see the Levite's frustration with her. Angry that she disrespected him that she alerted another man of his inability to keep her, to tame her. I can't help but notice this woman's cry for help, her attempt at finding safety and sanctuary in her father's house, only to have her abuser entertained and cared for. Oh, I can't help but see how helpless this woman must have felt to have returned home with a man who claimed her as nothing more than a concubine. I can't help but notice that she ran away. I can't help but picture singer Ariana Grande invited to her father's house to honor the mother of gospel, the queen of soul, the great Aretha Franklin. I can't help but picture her believing that as a young woman, she could come into her father's house and find safety and sanctuary from toxic masculinity. I can't help but picture her helpless, her side breast pinched by the vice grip of a Levite, a man of God. I can't help but see her leaning away in discomfort. Dedicated to winning her back like any abuser, I see this Levite as a master manipulator. I see this smooth-talking preacher, that slick-mouthed elder, that, that salacious worship leader speaking kindly to her, convincing her of his love for her, of his appreciation of her, professing those infamous words, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. And I see our vulnerable protagonist falling for his appeals as they leave her father's house to journey home. Along their journey, the Bible says the Levite decided it was best for them to rest in Gibeah. When they reached that city, no one accepted them into their home until an old man finally let them stay with him. And the Bible says, while they were enjoying themselves, all of a sudden, wicked men of the city surrounded the house and beat on the door. They said to the man, who was the owner of the house, bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. Afraid and disgusted, the host says, please don't do this evil against my brother. After all, this man has come into my house. Don't commit this horrible outrage. Here, let me bring out my virgin daughter and the man's concubine now. Abuse them and do whatever you want to them, but don't commit this outrageous thing against this man. The second reason God does not intervene to protect this concubine is to show that when God ceases to be king, men prioritize their safety and security over the safety and security of women. In these verses, we see that both the man's virgin daughter and the Levite's concubine are viewed as mere instruments of sexual pleasure. According to this man's statement, we can infer that it's lawful and natural for a woman to be used for sexual pleasure, even if it's against her will and brings about physical abuse. Even if it brings harm to her body. The abuse of women is so lawful and natural that he doesn't consider it to be a horrible outrage. That it would be, it would not be a horrible outrage to abuse them but a horrible outrage to abuse the man. These verses show that when God ceases to be king, women inevitably are viewed as objects, items, property, possessions whose sole purpose and existence is to endure the aggression and arousal of men. Just like in Sodom and Gomorrah, there is absolutely no thought given to either of these statements. 
Both fathers offer their daughters up to abusive mobs like sexually abusing women is a social expectation that we cannot avoid. In these verses, we see how this man prioritizes the comfort and protection of the Levite over the comfort and protection of his own daughter and the concubine. Their purity can always be sacrificed if it means preserving a man's life. Because when a woman is merely property, she will subsequently be treated like an object. And so we see the Levite seize his concubine and throw her outside. The Bible says they raped her and abused her all night until morning. At daybreak, they let her go. Some of us know what it's like to wait for daybreak. To wait for that moment when light begins to crack. To wait for that moment when it has to stop because abuse rarely takes place in the daytime. Some of us know what it's like to live to daybreak. Your sister knows what it's like to live through the theft of her purity. Your mother knows what it's like to live through the muzzling of her screams. Your cousin knows what it's like to live through the bruising of her body. You know what it's like to live through a night of violence and violation, a night where your needs don't matter, a night where your strength is overpowered, a night where your pleasure is secondary, a night where your safety is irrelevant, a night where your humanity is questioned, a night where your master has given you away to the crowd and left you for dead. Some of us in here right now know what it's like to wait for daybreak. Our story concludes with the Levite arising in the morning, opening the door of the house that he safely rested in, ready to leave for his journey home. The Bible says he saw his concubine collapsed near the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. Barely clinging to life, reaching out for help, the Levite finds his concubine battered, bruised, and beaten within an inch of her life. The woman who took on his pain. The woman who gave up her body to save his. The woman who took his beating. Abuse that was directed at him. This woman, he looks down at and says, get up. Let's go. Now, I don't know about you, but this sealed the deal for me. If I didn't know that he put his hands on her before Pastor Josiah, I know now. All this about speaking kindly to her. It's nothing but patriarchal potpourri. Because only an abuser can look at an abused woman like nothing is wrong. Only a man without God as his king can look at the battered body of an abused woman and not see injustice. Our story ends with the Levite taking a knife and cutting the concubine limb by limb into 12 pieces and sending her ravaged and dismembered body to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we don't know if the abuse killed her the night before or if the Levite did. All we know is that her story was not buried. All we know is that her story was not silenced. Now, I don't know what the Levites' intentions were, but what I do know is that he started a war. 
this intentional display of the injustice of toxic masculinity inflicted on an innocent body reminds me of the courageous act of a mother in Chicago, Illinois. In the summer of 1955, a, man, a woman by the name of Mammy Till allowed her 14-year-old son Emmett to visit his cousins in Mississippi. Now, while he was there, he was accused and brutally murdered for allegedly whistling at a white woman. Allegedly. For this crime, they shot him in the face with a shotgun at point-blank range, tied a fan to his feet, and threw him in the river. When authorities found his body, it was so distorted, he was no longer recognizable. Mammy Till held the funeral services for her son in their hometown of Chicago, and she opened the casket and said, I think everybody needed to see and know what happened to Emmett Till. That's right, that's right. Reporters attended the funeral and the photo of a young black boy's mangled body. The victim of the violence of white supremacy it circulated all over the country in a matter of days. African Americans all over the US were angered by Emmett's killing and the injustice of his case. Thousands were joining the NAACP and other activist organizations galvanizing to fight for racial justice. In December of that same year, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery City bus and was arrested. When asked later why she wouldn't give up her seat, she said, quote, I thought of Emmett Till, and when the bus driver ordered me to move to the back, I just couldn't move, end quote. And the civil rights movement was born. Thinking of these two stories, the story of Emmett Till and the concubine from Bethlehem, the lack of justice for the both of them was hard for me. Okay. Amen. Amen. It wasn't until last year that the white woman who accused Emmett Till for inappropriately harassing her admitted that she lied. While both of these stories expose the brokenness of a masculinity that is separated from God, it does not provide any justice for the rape beaten and broken bodies of either the concubine or Emmett Till. For weeks I labored over this text trying to find the hope. Trying to find justice for the woman. Trying to find justice for those who are victims of physical and sexual abuse. And it was in that moment that the spirit reminded me that like the concubine of Bethlehem, Christ was given away to a nation that had no king. Hey! For our comfort, he was homeless. Yeah. For our safety, he was vulnerable. For our protection, he was unguarded. For our preservation, he was sacrificed. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him within an inch of his life. They spat on his face, tore his flesh with 39 lashes. And when that wasn't enough, they punctured his flesh with a sword because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Like the Levite, Many of us sit in spiritual comfort. Like the Levite, we threw the creator of the universe to an angry mob and let them have their way with him. Our God let broken humanity break him because he understands that broken bodies save nations. The battered body of Emmett Till started the civil rights movement. The broken body of the concubine started the war against Benjamin. The bruised body of Christ started Christianity. The question we've got to ask ourselves is what does God want to save with our broken bodies? Who does God want to save through 
your physical abuse? Who does God want to save through your physical abuse? I go back to the question I asked in the beginning. Why would God save the virgin daughters from evil men in Gomorrah, but allow the concubine to be abused and murdered by evil men in Gibeah? And I think the answer is that God is tired of broken humanity looking to him to intervene on matters that we have the power to stop. God is waiting for the broken women, particularly women of color, to send us to war. Brittany Cooper in her book, Eloquent Rage, says, quote, we should not have to rely on supernatural acts of God to keep women safe, end quote. How many times has God cried out for justice? How many times must God look upon the earth and see that no one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth? How many times must he look down on the earth displeased? Isaiah writes, the Lord saw that there was no justice and he was offended. He saw that there was no man. He was amazed that there was no one interceding, end quote. Meaning, the exertion of strength and sexuality is not what makes you a man. According to this text, Your ability to intercede on behalf of the vulnerable and the oppressed is what makes you a man. I believe God repeatedly allows women to experience the pain of physical and sexual abuse at the hands of men, particularly men in the church, because God needs us to understand that the safety and protection of women and girls is our responsibility not his. God in his wisdom allowed his son, allows our daughters, our wives, and sometimes even our sons to experience the pain of physically and sexually broken bodies because he's trying to activate the anger of his people. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Saints, where is your righteous anger? God is trying to develop within us an eloquent rage. In her book, Cooper defines eloquent rage as an anger that is clear, expressive, to the point, and inspires change in individual lives and systems. He's not calling us to blind, mindless aggression. God is calling us to have eloquent rage, a rage that is controlled, a rage that is informed about the issues, a rage that is focused and targeted, a rage that is organized, a rage that is fueled by what Dr. King called divine dissatisfaction, a rage that wages war against the injustice and violence that sin unceasingly produces. We are living in a time where our nation is without a king. As the household of faith, our responsibility is to declare war against rape. Declare war against the silencing of women. Declare war against discrimination against women. Declare war against the theft of women's purity. Declare war against the physical and sexual abuse of women. Declare war against flirtation in the workplace. Declare war against jokes that denigrate women. Declare war against the plagiarism of women's intellectual property. We've seen this story repeated in scripture and in our present reality. God has only allowed this story to repeat itself to teach us that patriarchy pales in the light of his sovereignty. He's only allowed this story to repeat itself so that we can learn that he requires that we rage war against injustice with an eloquent rage. Let's learn the lesson. 
Let's stop letting these stories repeat themselves over and over again. Who else has to be abused before we get enraged? Who else's body must be broken before eloquent rage can send us to war? Mm. 